I'm Ross Allison, and welcome to Unknown Truth. Today I'm standing on the deck of the historic Turner Joy in the waters of Bremerton, Washington. It seems that this ship could very well be haunted, and so we're here to find out if there's any truth to that. The USS Turner Joy one of 18 Forrest Sherman class destroyers of the United States Navy was built by the Puget Sound Bridge and Dredging Company of Seattle. It was commissioned August 3, 1959 at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Bremerton, Washington. She was named after Admiral Charles Turner Joy and participated exclusively in the Vietnam War and was one of the principal ships involved in the Gulf of Tonkin incident in 1964. Decommissioned November 22, 1982, the USS Turner Joy was obtained by the Bremerton Historic Ships Association and was opened to the public in 1990. I'm Steve Borner. I am the director of the Turner Joy DD-951 here in Bremerton, Washington. The Turner Joy is actually a memorial ship. It was started here in 1990 as a museum. Right now we have about 90% of the ship open for the public's viewing. Uh, we do overnights for Cub Scouts and uh, church groups or whatever reunions. We try to use it as an educational tool for the community. My name is Merlin Ahern and I'm a psychic. I came on the Turner Joy today for the first time and when I first entered and I was on board the top of the ship I felt uh, there was big gunnery there and I felt that that something had happened there, something devastating. There was definitely a feeling like some that something went wrong here, there was a, a bang. On board the Turner Joy in 1965 in the Tonkin Gulf at Mount 53, they had a very unfortunate accident where three men, they paid the ultimate price. The uh, gun mount exploded and uh, taking the lives of three men. What led up to it was they were doing heavy shore bombardment, supporting troops on the beach. And this caused the barrels of the guns to heat up. When they fired, they had what they called a hang fire. And this is when the shell misfired and did not go off. There's a special procedure they follow, and one of them was to wait about 20 minutes for cool down, open the breech of the gun, remove the shell casing that did not go off, that is the powder charge, hand it out and throw it over the side. Then, they, would, they put in what they call a, a short charge, close the breech of the gun, fire it, and expel the projectile out the end of the barrel. Well, unfortunately, they did remove the uh, powder casing, threw it over the side, and then just as they were getting ready to put in the short charge, the projectile in the barrel got hot and they had what they called a cook-off, and this exploded. And it was instantly taking the lives of two men inside the gun mount, and later on the third man that was standing outside the gun mount, he died from injuries about three days later. The three men that were killed were gunner's mate Carl W. Deaton, he was the mount captain, Glenn M. Lane, and Thomas P. Miller. There was, there was some injuries here, and I feel like they brought them in inside. I'm, I'm feeling like they, 
I, I almost feel like there was not enough room in the hospital or the, the um, medic area. And so some of the men were put, I want to say the mess hall. The most dire one was put into the medic area and the other two were put into the, the mess. here there's a man standing what I believe is starboard right over there while we were on board the deck outside and we were looking at the gunnery I felt and saw a tall gentleman in a white outfit a uniform dark hair watching us just kind of observing what we were doing and then I noticed he walked kind of away from us and up the stairs. When I first started, about 15 years ago, I was started with a guy and he had had me go up the forward bow compartment and turn on all the lights and get it ready to open up for visitors. And always I'd get a, a neary feeling going forward. mentioned it to him one time and he said yes he that he got the same feeling a couple of community service girls that were working in that same area and uh, they said they seen shadows when they were working up there and they absolutely refused to go back up there and work my name is Anthony Moore. I am a lead maintenance mechanic, and I oversee community service kids. We went to work down in the forward berthing, went down to the bottom of the ladder, and I started turning on lights. The two kids come down the ladder after me, and as soon as I got to the bottom ladder, there's a mirror on the wall. took off shrieking back up the ladder. I finally catch up with them and ask them what was going on. They told me that they couldn't work down in the forward berthing. Uh, it really creeped them out. Uh, and I asked what creeped them out, and they had told me that there was a image in the mirror. Bob McCray and I've uh, been an investigator for one year with ACOS. Is there anybody in the in the bunks? We came on the Turner Joy to uh, take a look at uh, the phenomenon that has been uh, happening uh, as far as apparitions and uh, EVPs that's uh, been reported. Is there anybody back here? Matt Halverson. I'm the senior editor at Seattle Metropolitan Magazine. Um, write about, about a bunch of different subjects and just so happened to choose ghost hunting this time. It was the first time I'd ever been on a ghost hunt before. Uh, I got to follow uh, the A-Ghost members around and, and watch them as they asked lots of questions basically into the ether, looking for responses, uh, looking for their K2 meters to light up. It was not exactly what I was expecting. Um, didn't see any specters or, or, or apparitions moving around, but uh, it was interesting because what I was struck by was the amount of uh, gear and, and technical expertise used to, to 
detect these things. It, was, it, was, it went beyond just looking around corners for suspicious movement or listening for sounds. It was um, uh, a, lot more, a lot more technical than I expected. Is there anybody would like to uh, get in contact with us? Can you make these lights light up for me? I certainly saw more than I expected to. Um, it was interesting the way that uh, the meters would light up directly after a question was asked. Uh, I wasn't expecting that. I mean, I came in a little dubious, to be perfectly honest, but I left convinced that something a little out of the ordinary was going on for sure. It was interesting to, to see just how well timed, I guess, the responses, so to speak, were. Members of a ghost would ask ask a question, and that meter, more times than not, would light up directly after they'd ask it. We picked up uh, 37 anomalies on our K2 meter. And on our voice recorder, we had uh, about eight uh, good uh, EVPs. One was there was a question asked about if he had a, a wife. Do you have a wife or children? I spent a lot of time in this area right here speaking to a ghost that we thought was named Carl, um, trying to determine why he was still here, who he was looking for, uh, and what he wanted. We had asked if, uh, when, uh, if he had met any women when uh, he was uh, aboard the, the ship when they made a port call. Probably the last girl you saw was when this ship made a, a port call to uh, Honolulu. Do you remember stopping in Hawaii? Did you meet somebody there? I'm getting a full all the way up to the red. And that's when I got a response uh, with my phone setting has a, a ringtone for my wife that's an alarm that uh, kind of gives a, a whooping sound like an emergency call. It's the wife! It's the wife! And uh, my phone had froze and I couldn't uh, get my phone to shut off and the K2 meter uh, had been pegged out and when we checked later for messages uh, there was uh, no messages for my wife, and when I asked her when I got home the next day if she had called, uh, she said that she wouldn't call me on an investigation. Two of the other investigators uh, that night uh, were dressed in Navy uniforms, and uh, this way they could see if they could get a response uh, uh, from any type of paranormal that there was uh, they would be fitting into the action and uh, while they were talking about uh, their uniforms and uh, what they were going to be doing uh, later when they played their recording they picked up a scuffle sound and uh, a voice uh, talking about a butt I don't think I've ever wore these things longer than five hours I don't think I've ever wore these things longer than five hours. I don't think I've ever wore these things longer than five hours. When I first entered and I was on board the, the sh top of the ship, I felt that something had happened there, something devastating. And it turns out there were three men that were ser seriously injured and did die. Uh, coming into the ship, I felt 
very strongly that at least two of those gentlemen are still here. The third, I feel, has probably crossed over. I feel like there's two predominant men here. There's a lot of layers, of course, of history, but there's two really predominant men. One is tall, dark hair. It's like a crew cut, but it's grown out some. It's, it's grown out enough to where you could comb it. He's the same guy I see up the starboard side, outside. I feel like they, they kind of are, they're still on duty. I feel like they're on duty still. When we were uh, down in the birthing unit, we wanted to put a name to the, the individual that uh, we thought we had uh, contact with. And uh, we would ask, does your name start with an A or have an A sound? And we wouldn't get any response until we would get to R. And uh, we said, uh, asked if it had an R sound to it. And uh, we got a light. We asked it, his name Robert Richard. And uh, then we went with names that had an R sound. And when we came to Carl, we got a, a full response uh, on our K2 meeting. The two spirits that are strongest here, they kind of are still on duty. They're still walking around here, still going about their business. They are aware of the people that come and go in this ship. I think they're curious, but again, I still feel like they think that it's it's all a part of, of their job to still work with the people, work with the ship. Five and a half, six years ago, I was working on a deck plate, lower level, main control. At that point in time, we were allowed to smoke on ship. Uh, upper level and main control, there was an alcove desk. I threw my cigarettes and lighter onto the alcove desk. Went down lower level, started to do my painting and prep work. And a little bit later, I get done with that and I go up to have a cigarette. My cigarette lighter just up and vanished. The door leading down to main control is a really loud door. So if anyone were to have come down and uh, mess with my stuff, I would have heard the door. Or the, or the ladder coming down. Even to this day, I have no idea where that ladder went. This area really feels heavy to me. I, I get the feeling that there's a lot of spirits here. There's a lot of the energy of the activity that happened in the past that still kind of lingers here. And it's really heavy in this mess area. I feel like um, it's kind of a combination of emotions such as, of course, there's that just the social energy going on, but also at times of, of stress. The mess hall has a lot of energy in it. But again, I feel like that's residual energy, past events, emotions from all of the soldiers or all of the uh, Navy men that have been here. I don't feel like a lot of that energy is, is spirits that are stuck here, other than the two significant spirits that are here. just say it, it, it's just you know by chance things happen but there was too many responses back to direct questions no matter how we would word the question later on we would still get the same response so do I believe that there's something going on in this ship yeah 
I think that there's somebody here that they take pride in the ship. I honestly think that there's spirits on here. I think they're just trapped. You know, they're not out to hurt no one. They're just trapped in their routine. It seems like there's something here, I, I, but then I'm not the one holding the, uh, the meters and the, and the gadgets to determine what is or isn't going on. Uh, but there, it seemed like there was something different going on, something a little out of the ordinary. Uh, there's nothing to fear. Um, these are good men. Uh, they mean no harm. Uh, they love the ship and they love their job. Many believe that the crew of the Turner Joy may still be on board. If so, why don't you pay the Turner Joy a visit and decide for yourself? I'm Ross Allison for Unknown Truth.